Friday morning. Um, my name is Patrick Doherty. I am the Deputy Director of the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. Today we're here to talk about Iran, specifically to explore the results of the most recent Iranian public opinion poll conducted before the parliamentary elections that are underway as we meet here today. We are delighted to partner with Ken Balin, uh, President of the Public Opinion Organization, Terror Free Tomorrow. Terror Free Tomorrow is one of the leading polling, polling outfits working to help Washington understand public attitudes in countries challenged by Islamic extremism. Led by Ken and guided by board members such as Lee Hamilton and John McCain, Terror Free Tomorrow is providing a critical service that allows reporters and analysts to see the more complex mosaic within some very opaque regions of the world. Today's event is part of a new initiative we are standing up here at New America, our counterterrorism counter and counterinsurgency initiative, led by New America's president and CEO Steve Call, as well as Schwartz senior fellow and CNN commentator Peter Bergen. The initiative seeks, among other things, to strengthen the stream of open source data and analysis on critical aspects of America's relations with the Islamic world and the organizations or states that conduct and promote terrorist operations. Now to begin. I want to quickly get to our distinguished panel, but first I, I thought I would share a recent quote made earlier this week in response to the action of Iran's Guardian Council to bar some 1,700 mostly reformist candidates from standing in today's elections. Here's the quote. People want freedom. The most important manifestation of freedom is the exercise of their sovereign right to determine their own destiny. He continues, freedom means that people be allowed to question the ruling system and change it without the use of force if the establishment doesn't respond to their demands. You may be asking who this is. The speaker is not George Bush, Condi Rice, or any one of the president, U.S. presidential candidates. The speaker is Mohammed Hatami, former Iranian president, cleric, and reformist leader. That statement by Hatami is a symbol of the serious internal challenges to the revolutionary clerics of the Guardian Council. In effect, the revolutionary elite in Tehran are trying to keep a lid on a population that is very dissatisfied in three dimensions, economically, politically, and diplomatically. While the Guardian Council has rigged today's elections, and no counter-revolution will emerge for some time, uh, the gap between public opinion and the Iranian government policies can be a major uh, factor internally. To explore this gap between Iranian public opinion and the Iranian leadership and what it means for the United States and the region more broadly, we have Ken Ballin, who will talk about his recent pre-election polling results, Flint Leverett, who will talk about the implications of these public attitudes for U.S. policymaking, and Steve Call, who I'm hoping will take these findings and place them in the broader context of the public opinion in two other Islamic states, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, and also ask what this means for the United States. Quickly to introduce our speakers, first we have Ken Ballin, the president of Terror Free Tomorrow, the Center for Public Opinion. Ken has had a fascinating career as a federal prosecutor prosecuting terrorism, organized crime, and international narcotics cases. He served as counsel to the House Iran-Contra hearings under Lee Hamilton and as chief counsel to a special investiga bipartisan investigative committee chaired by John McCain. We're happy to have Ken here today. Uh, then we have Flint Leverett. Flint is a senior fellow here at New America in the American Strategy Program, where he directs the Geopolitics of Energy Initiative. Serving in the U.S. government from 1992 to 2003, Flint rose to the position of Senior Director for Middle East Affairs at the National mm -hmm. Security Council. Before that, he was Middle East expert at the, uh, <clears throat> on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, having joined State from a perch as a Senior Middle East Analyst at the CIA. Amongst, among Flint's many publications, is a 2006 book entitled Dealing with Tehran, Assessing U.S. Diplomatic Options Towards Iran. Batting cleanup today, we are pleased to have Steve Call, President and CEO of the New America Foundation, and as I mentioned, co-director of our new counterterrorism and counterinsurgency initiative. Steve spent 20 years at the Washington Post from foreign correspondent covering South Asia all the way to managing, managing editor. During that time, somehow he managed to write two Pulitzer Prize winning books, one on the SEC and the other entitled Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan, and Bin Laden. He's just spent a lot of time on the ground in Pakistan reporting for The New Yorker and is about to launch his latest book on the Bin Laden family. With that, I'll turn it over to Ken Ballin to get us started. Ken?
Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, thank you, Flint. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to New America for hosting this uh, forum this morning. Let me begin with uh, a question that some of you may have but may be afraid to ask, which is, why does public opinion in Iran even matter to us? Well, I, I, I hear a chuckle. I mean, I think that I, I struck a nerve with that question because if you actually, if you look at the news coverage, there are elections today in Pakistan. I'm in Pakistan. I have Pakistan on my mind. Sorry, Steve. I, I've, I've been focused on Pakistan. There are elections today in Iran. Uh, in fact, there should be finished voting right about now. We don't hear very much about it, and in the coverage of the elections in the American and international media, sure. in the coverage of the elections in the international media and in the American media, the elections are being reported, but without asking a very fundamental question. What do the people of Iran themselves want? Maybe it's because we're so inured to polls here in the United States. In fact, we're bombarded with them. Not, a, not five minutes go by, particularly in this election year, where we don't see another poll. We're also a nerd to the power of public opinion here in the United States. Indeed, in the Democratic campaign right now, Senator Obama is talking about how he can uh, effectuate change through the, through the power of public opinion from the ground up. Senator Clinton responds, you need a leader who can lead that public opinion from the top down. But both concur, and indeed our entire uh, consensus here is that there is a strong power to public opinion. We take surveys for granted. They're part of the background noise that accompanies everything. In fact, they're too much part of the background noise. However, in other countries, without the experience that we have, public opinion polls can serve as an important and essential building block to democratic governance. And here comes Pakistan, because the surveys in Pakistan that occurred before the election less than a month ago, as one of the leading newspapers in Pakistan said, were an important element in the civil society movement that helped prevent the Musharraf government from rigging the elections. And indeed, when we did a survey in Iran last June, we saw the results in the blogosphere in Iran. We saw the results among student organizations in Iran. The validation that occurred from knowing what your fellow citizens think knowing what your fellow citizens want is something that cannot be easily dismissed. Okay, so that's Iran, you say. What about for us? Why do we care what they think? Well, you know what? The problem with American foreign policy towards Iran since the revolution is that we don't care what the people think. We have not taken public opinion into account. American policy towards Iran, I think we can all agree, has not succeeded. That's putting it mildly. It's failed. We've also failed to factor in what the people in Iran want. I would submit to you if we can understand better, not completely because we won't be able to, but if we can understand better what the people of Iran think, we can support their desires without linking Iranian opposition groups to the United States. We can further constructive engagement with Iran, with the government of Iran, without unduly and unnecessarily empowering regime hardliners. Boy, you say, that's a tall order. That's a diplomatic balancing act of the first magnitude. Indeed, it is. But you know what? That was a diplomatic balancing act that for decades was the cornerstone of U.S. policy during the Cold War. But we've neglected to apply it today. I would argue that today it's even more important to apply it, given the kind of adversaries that we face and the importance of ground-up movements that we seem to recognize so easily here in the United States, but sometimes have a hard time seeing overseas. In fact, President Reagan said that our greatest ally in the Cold War was the average Soviet citizen, Citizen Ivan, he called him. The public opinion, the power of people inside the so Soviet Union and uh, in Eastern Europe. Well, I think, if nothing else, the survey that I'm about to discuss with you today demonstrates that this is no less true with Iran right now. Let me begin a brief word on methodology. 
Yeah. I think we're. I'll let Flint reposition himself. Maybe, Flint, you're blocking out the best part of the findings. I don't yeah. know. Or the worst part. I should keep you right there. Uh, th this poll was expertly conducted by our partner, D3 Systems, who has extensive experience, perhaps more than anybody else, coming from the outside doing uh, phone surveys into Iran. And they're represented in the front row here this morning, and I'm pleased to have them here. Let me tell you this, rather than dwell on methodology, uh, we post uh, the full methodology on our website along with all the poll results and answers and I think it's presented in a, a transparent fashion uh, and we pride ourselves in that. People ask, well, how can you conduct a phone survey in Iran? Well, 90 percent of the people, 90 plus percent in Iran have landline telephones. So uh, it's like conducting a survey in, in, in many nations. Uh, with widespread telephone penetration. That chart's hard to read, but if you go to our report and website, it's easy to read. Okay, we asked people, who are you going to vote for? Well, the most popular choice for Iranians was not on the ballot. You can safely say that they're not inspired by this election or the choices that they're offered. 8% said they would vote broadly for conservatives, 22% for reformists, 32 percent for neither, and number two in the balloting was don't know, another popular choice. Indeed, one of the reasons for this is, I think, an important question and answer. The government excluded, as Patrick said, reformists, many reformists from running in this election. The people of Iran do not agree with the government's decision. Sixty-eight percent thought that all reformist candidates should be allowed to contest these elections. Only 10 percent felt that the government made the right decision in barring reformist candidates from running. More significantly, I believe the vision of the Iranian people for a more open and fully democratic system of government remains powerful. Eighty-six percent of those surveys said they favor a government where the supreme leader and all their leaders are elected directly by the people, 9 percent opposed. As you know, undoubtedly, the power and role of the supreme leader is at the core of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Our survey found that almost 9 in 10 voters want that most powerful official in Iran to be held accountable to the voters. Indeed, apart from the economy, the priorities that Iranians think are important for their government are ensuring free elections and free press and other indicia of a democratic, fully democratic system. They have a somewhat democratically democratic system, it's certainly taken a blow in the latest round. Uh, you see that nu uh, developing nuclear weapons among the priorities we gave them was the least important. Iranians remain strongly pro-American. They favor their government working with the United States to resolve the Iraq War. They favor full and unconditional negotiations. Three quarters, more than three quarters, favor normal trade and recognition between the two nations. Only 14 percent oppose that. Again, our website, I'm not going to dwell on the numbers. Our website, if you want to get into the weeds here, you can find all the questions and answers. Uh, on the nuclear issue, a majority favor the development of nuclear weapons. And in a disturbing trend from our last survey in June, those that think that developing nuclear weapons or possessing them is not at all an important goal, has dropped from a third to 20 percent. And I'll be commenting on this in a minute. There is a change that is going on, and it is not necessarily a good trend. Support for a deal on nuclear weapons remains strong among the Iranian people themselves. Seventy percent of Iranians favor full inspection and a guarantee to ensure that there are no nuclear weapons if Iran receives in return from other countries 
you can see the various categories, trade and investment, trade and investment in energy, assistance for peaceful nuclear energy, humanitarian assistance. It remains constant at about 70 percent. This is a slight drop from when we asked this question last time in June, uh, when about 80 percent felt that way. With the United States, they also favor a deal, but again, the numbers have dropped. They're not quite as willing to uh, make concessions, but they are still willing to make concessions in, turn, in return for U.S. recognition and normal trade relations. Another uh, interesting change from the last time we surveyed is opinions on the Iranian economy. We hear constantly in the press how dissatisfied Iranians are with the economy. Well, in June, when we asked whether the economy was headed in the right direction or the wrong direction, 27 percent of Iranians said it was headed in the right direction, 32 percent, I'm sorry, uh, 42 percent in the wrong direction. Now you've seen a shift. 42 percent of Iranians say it's headed in the right direction um, and 32 percent wrong direction. In terms of President Ahmadinejad's policy specifically in succeeding in reducing employment and inflation, we see, again, uh, an uptick in that number. And I would also say what was interesting that's not reflected here is the difference between Tehran and the rest of the nation on this issue. People are much more positive about the economy in the provinces than they are in Tehran. I think this might be good news if the trend continues for President Ahmadinejad. On Israel, there is no support. We often hear that President Ahmadinejad's rhetoric on Israel is playing to the Arab street. Our poll shows it's also playing to the Iranian street. Uh, Two-thirds of Iranians said they oppose any peace treaty recognizing Israel and favor all Muslims fighting until there is no state of Israel in the Middle East. Only a quarter favored a peace treaty recognizing Israel if an independent Palestinian state is, is established. These numbers are identical, identical interestingly enough, to our survey in Saudi Arabia in December where 63 or 4 percent said the, of Saudis said the exact same thing and rejected specifically in our survey King Abdullah's peace plan, even with his name attached to it. Yeah, so I thought that was a very interesting result. Here it's an interesting result and naturally they support military <coughs> and financial aid. And a lot of people who know Iran better than I do, and Iranians, are surprised by these results because, uh, at least within Tehran, they feel that the opinion is, it, it does not reflect this. Well, our survey showed otherwise. We were talking earlier about how American policy can impact and relate to public sentiment and attitudes in Iran. Well, we asked Iranians exactly that. We asked Iranians what would improve the opinion of the United States. And you see the answers right there. Increasing a free trade treaty between Iran and the United States, increasing visas for Iranians to come study and work, withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq, and the U.S. reopening the embassy and engaging in negotiations. That, that dropped a little bit. This, these results surprise some people. They do not surprise me. The reason they don't surprise me is they're almost identical to the results that we found in Pakistan. People want visas. People want trade. People want American policies that impact them directly in their own daily lives. That is the key. We saw the same results in Saudi Arabia. We saw the same results in Indonesia and in Bangladesh and Nigeria and so on. People want policies from the United States that affect them in their, in their daily lives. What they like about the United States are, is economic opportunity, they respect political freedom, democracy. What they don't like about the United States is American foreign policy. So if America adopts policies that relate directly to the needs and wants of people in very tangible ways, such as increasing visas, such as microcredit in poorer countries, etc., it makes a substantial and measurable impact on public opinion, much more so than kind of grand policy statements. <laughs> What does not improve opinion is also quite interesting. U.S. working to spread democracy inside Iran. Well, this is not very popular among Iranians. Despite the fact that Iranians clearly want a more democratic system and, and that is a priority for them, they do not want the United States behind a more democratic system. And, and the United States doing that 
simply taints. This is empirical proof. A lot of people have criticized policies that support um, uh, directly um, uh, Iranian opposition groups. This is empirical uh, proof, though, that the Iranian people don't think highly of it, nor, nor would they be terribly impressed by a comprehensive Middle East peace between Israel's and Israelis and Palestinians. Now, maybe if that actually were a reality, those numbers would change. But since right now most Iranians don't want the state of Israel at all, you can imagine it's not illogical for them to conclude that a peace treaty is not something they desire either. Public opinion, yes, matters. It matters to the building of democracy in Iran and other countries. It matters to American foreign policy, or it should matter to American foreign policy. We saw its success in many ways during the Cold War. We see its failure now in policies towards Iraq, in policies towards uh, uh, Pakistan, and lastly, in policies towards Iran. By understanding what Iranians think, we can fashion policies that will more effectively deal with the regime that now exists in power. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ken. Flint, if you could give us your analysis. All right. Thank you. Um, what I want to do is to spend a few minutes reflecting on these results that, that Ken Ballin has just presented and reflect on them with particular reference to um, the American discussion of Iran. Um, I think that there is a sort of conventional wisdom narrative in the United States about Iranian politics and U.S.-Iranian relations. And that conventional wisdom narrative um, in a lot of important ways shapes our discussion of policy options toward Iran. And while Republicans, Democrats, different camps of foreign policy elites will draw somewhat different implications of what this conventional wisdom narrative means for U.S. policy or should mean for U.S. policy, I think all of these elites and the broader body politic are operating more or less off of the same narrative. That's why I call it the conventional wisdom narrative. And what the, these poll results suggests, um, suggest, at least to me, is that in some fundamental respects that conventional wisdom narrative about Iran, Iranian politics, U.S.-Iranian relations, that conventional wisdom narrative is um, really ill-informed. Um, what is that conventional wisdom narrative in broad terms? Well, I'll break it down into three parts. Uh, it's a sort of narrative about Iranian politics, internal political dynamics. There's a narrative about the nuclear issue. And then there's a narrative about Iranian perspectives on U.S.-Iranian relations. On domestic politics, I think that the conventional wisdom narrative here um, says that there is a profoundly dissatisfied population in Iran. It is a population which has repeatedly shown its interest in its commitment to a more open a more participatory kind of politics in Iran. Um, those, that interest has been consistently thwarted by um, particularly the unelected parts of the Iranian political system. And you have a really disaffected population. And it goes beyond a simple disaffection in that you have a population which is in um, some very important respects deeply alienated from the regime, deeply alienated from the political order of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so the policy implication 
of that narrative is that U.S. policies should in various ways try to play on that division between rulers and ruled, and that by playing on those divisions, we could, um, we will have a better chance of compelling changes in Iranian policies that we don't like. And for some, by playing on these, on these divisions between rulers and ruled in Iran, you can even um, encourage um, all-out regime change, you know, getting rid of the Islamic Republic of Iran in favor of some alternative system. On the nuclear issue, I think the conventional wisdom narrative suggests that um, the nuclear issue is not really a popular issue. It is essentially uh, an, an, an issue, an initiative that's driven by elites in the Iranian system. The population as a whole is not particularly invested in it. And so therefore, on that basis, it should be possible to persuade most Iranians to give up that nuclear initiative. Um, some would argue that, you know, you get them to give it up by raising the costs to the Iranian public of continuation of the nuclear program. Others would argue that you get them to give it up by um, you know, holding out the promise of benefits if they'll give it up, but that in the end you can play on this kind of lack of a popular base of support for the nuclear program to um, induce um, Iran to abandon its, its current nuclear program. And then with regard to U.S. relations, relations with the U.S., I think the conventional wisdom narrative says, you know, Iranians are basically pro-American. They like the United States. They want to have um, positive relations with the United States. And that therefore, on that basis, the United States should be trying to engage the Iranian public um, through various forms of public diplomacy and even democracy promotion in Iran. And that, again, the fact that the Iranian people are so pro-American can be used, can be played upon to um, leverage the political elite, the policymaking establishment in Tehran. And one of the many things that I find so fascinating about the polling data that, that Ken and his colleagues have generated is that I think their polling data would suggest that that conventional wisdom narrative regarding Iranian politics, the nuclear issue, and relations with the U.S., that that conventional wisdom narrative is in um, some critical respects profoundly misinformed. With regard to domestic politics, I would argue that the most important thing that um, the polling results show is that is Iran is not a society in any sort of pre-revolutionary condition. There is certainly a lot of dissatisfaction um, in Iran with politicians and the political process. Of course, we have none of that dissatisfaction here with our own political processes here in the United States, but um, it certainly seems to be um, a readily observable phenomenon in Iran. Um, but it is a kind of dissatisfaction that is related to perceptions of particular conditions. You know, I was really struck that perceptions of how the Iranian economy is doing 
have actually improved since last year according to Ken's polls. Now the conventional wisdom in the United States, the conventional wisdom narrative about Iranian politics doesn't allow for that. You know, it's people are unhappy and they're getting unhappier. Okay, well what we, what this suggests is that yes, people can get unhappy when they think their conditions are bad. But when they think that their conditions are improving, they can get less unhappy. And so it's not, to me, some sort of fundamental alienation with the system, but a sense of dissatisfaction with the way that the system performs at specific times on specific issues, and that level of dissatisfaction can fluctuate according to how conditions are perceived. The other really important point here is that I think the polls, the, Ken's polls would show that Iranians are still basically prepared to work with and participate in the system. He had a, uh, I don't think it was one, a number that he showed, but in the, uh, the data that I saw, there's one question that's asked about, you know, do you intend to vote? Now, to some degree, you know, given the government's very heavy emphasis on voting in Iran, you could have a little bit of a phenomenon of over-reporting, overstating, you know, people saying, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and vote, um, when it's not really clear that they, they will. But still, 80% of the people in the poll are saying, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and vote. And if you look at actual participation rates in Iranian elections in recent years, you did see what looked like it was going to be a decline in participation rates in the early years of this decade. But over the most recent electoral cycles, you know, participation rates um, for the various kinds of elections that have happened in Iran um, those participation rates have, have held up and even gone up to some degree. I mean, I, I think a higher percentage of Iranians voted in their presidential election uh, the last time than, than voted in the U.S. presidential election. And so I don't see this as a society that's in a pre-revolutionary state. I think this is a society where people want their system to be better. They want it to be more open. They want it to work more effectively to address their problems. They want the Islamic Republic of Iran to be a better place for them. But I don't see this as a society that's ready to dump the Islamic Republic of Iran for some unknown um, alternative future. <coughs> On the nuclear issue, um, here I thought the results were really striking in terms of their, um, their, their um, undermining the conventional wisdom narrative here in the United States. Um, I thought the most remarkable number was 78 percent of Iranians support Iran's development of uh, nuclear energy. 78% support that. And while the Iranian people would support <coughs> efforts to make their nuclear energy program more transparent in order to assuage international concerns that it was really just a cover for a nuclear weapons program, they would support steps to make it more transparent. They're not willing to give it up. Even on the nuclear weapons issue, you know, Ken's data would suggest that 52% of Iranians would support the development of nuclear weapons. Now, they may, you know, not rank it that high up in terms of a comparative scale of priorities for their government 
but still 52% would support the development of nuclear weapons. Um, opposition to the development of nuclear weapons is dropping. And, you know, even in terms of using the nuclear program as a bargaining chip, again, you know, I see there's, there's no real support for giving up this program. Even, you know, leave aside the weaponization aspect, just the civil nuclear program, including the fuel cycle activities, there's no popular support for giving this up. Yes, we'll support measures to make it transparent to the international community, but we're not going to give this up. And then on relations with the United States, I thought here there were some very interesting, um, very interesting insights. Um, obviously, this poll, when you have 50 percent, 6 percent of Iranians saying that U.S.-sponsored democracy promotion is not a good idea. Um, you know, I think that says a lot about uh, some aspects of current U.S. policy toward Iran. But it also says some interesting things to me about the way that U.S. policy is perceived. And here I would argue that the, the poll results would suggest that Iranians would see, you know, U.S. sanctions against Iran not as something that says something bad about them or even something that says something bad about their regime. It's something that says something bad about the United States. You know, it's a, for Iranians, it's a U.S. problem that the U.S. imposes um, unilateral sanctions of various sorts and leads the charge internationally to impose multilateral sanctions. You know, this is not making Iranians fundamentally rethink um, the wisdom of what their government is doing. It sort of confirms their sense that U.S. policy, from their standpoint, is dysfunctional. And, you know, in terms of my own view of U.S. policy toward Iran, I've argued for a long time, and if you want to read my argument, there is that Century Foundation monograph that Patrick mentioned in the introduction. You can pick up a copy of it um, out on the table. But, you know, I've argued that what we need to be willing to do is to pursue a grand bargain with the Islamic Republic. Um, that would include, as part of a comprehensive settlement of bilateral differences, would include um, U.S. willingness to accept the Islamic Republic, even to provide a security guarantee, a commitment that we won't use force to change the borders or form of government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I think that if we want to put this relationship on a more positive trajectory than it's on right now, uh, I think Ken's right, we need to pay attention to what Iranians themselves are thinking and wanting and aspiring to. Um, and I think if we took these poll results seriously, um, we really would, as Americans, we really would have to rethink some very long-standing aspects of our policy posture toward Iran regarding sanctions, regarding democracy promotion, regarding our willingness to engage with the Iranian regime on the full range of bilateral differences between the United States and Iran. And in that sense, I hope that uh, the poll results that Ken's just presented really will have um, some impact on the way that we, we talk about Iran. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Flint. Um, Steve, if you could. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to uh, offer some observations that I think are complementary uh, to Flint's, but maybe distinct, and particularly to try to tease out 
a few qualitative themes to um, complement the quantitative picture that we've seen up on the screen. And I want to start by emphasizing a point that I think Flint made, but even to take it further, which is that in any society, and particularly in Iran over the last 10 years, public opinion is dynamic over time. And while, for instance, I would accept the assessment that Flint makes that today public opinion in Iran is demonstrably not pre-revolutionary in character, I'd like to go back 10 years and come forward quickly by saying first that if there was a period when public opinion in Iran had pre-revolutionary characteristics, it was probably in the sort of 1998 to 2002 period. And in fact, the failure of the momentum of the student movement and the disappointment that certainly urban um, activists felt about the reformists uh, consolidated into, and, and as well as the effectiveness of the regime in, in defeating um, the students, coincided with uh, the American invasion of Iraq. It all sort of happened around the same time. And I think what you've seen since then is a dynamic series of uh, sort of changes of view among Iranians about their own position their own position vis-a-vis -vis their own government, their own revolution, and uh, the United States. And it's been quite a dramatic period in the neighborhood, and, and uh, perhaps less dramatic in, inside Iran, but still significant changes there as well. So, for example, um, the public opinion described in this survey about attitudes towards nuclear weapons and the um, hardening of attitudes uh, in other areas of Iranian public opinion could be interpreted, and I tend to interpret those that kind of fall outside the margin of error while being cautious about changes in public opinion that occur in sort of six-month intervals as essentially a hardening of nationalist attitudes in Iran for a variety of reasons. And of course, attitudes towards nuclear weapons are really public attitudes are really a proxy for nationalism. That's certainly true. Uh, in Pakistan has always been true in Pakistan. It's not so much that public opinion has a considered, a considered view of deterrence or the risks or benefits of a deterrent strategy or an offensive nuclear strategy. It's, it's a proxy, it's a symbolic proxy for, na for nationalism and national pride and national identity and to some extent national coherence. And so if you see that metric hardening, it sort of suggests a broader hardening of a kind of defensive nationalist attitude. Now, that wouldn't be surprising in Iran today, would it, given the pressure that Iran has uh, been on the receiving end um, uh, of from the United States and elsewhere, and also because of the simultaneous kind of ebbing of opposition uh, to the government, in a sense, I think, of resignation and acceptance among sort of fence-sitters in Iran that uh, this pre-revolutionary moment of five years or so ago is gone. And so there's really a new, a, a kind of a new equation um, afoot. And you can see, interestingly, that, that uh, even though there is an acceptance and a kind of hardening of public attitudes that way, there's still an aspiration for internal accountability and internal reform and, and, um, and even access to uh, sort of democracy in some sense, electoral democracy. I think another qualitative um, aspect of Iranian public opinion involves ambivalence about, uh, persistent ambivalence about the consequences of engagement with the West. Um, the, the last time I was there uh, was shortly after the U.S. invasion and of Iraq and not through any official channels, but just by wandering on to various uh, university campuses, ended up connecting to about two dozen leaders of the student movement, really at the moment when they were just giving up, and uh, had long conversations about the consequences of either U.S. military pressure or um, U.S. grand bargain engagement. And what you heard was not a, any sort of fixed view, but a, a sort of debate and ambivalence about how the benefits of engagement might be distributed within Iranian politics and what the consequences 
of that distribution would be for evolutionary democratic reform. Because I think that that's, and I think the data backs this up, that there's a consensus about a desire for a national synthesis fashioned by Iranians for Iranian uh, society and, and in advancement of Iranian interests. And that synthesis would involve uh, a new kind of democratic accountability for the revolution and for the regime, one that is clearly absent and about which there remains frustration. Uh, it would it would also um, involve uh, a synthesis of post-revolutionary culture. And you see this in Pakistan as well. I think there is a sense among the generation raised in the revolution that they have an idea about how to reinterpret the revolution in their own lives. They are, they are certainly not secularists, although you can find secularists in Tehran who are connected to the diaspora. But they're, but they're looking for space in which to reinterpret the revolution in their own lives and in their own society. And, and I think that that is some of what uh, the, both the aspiration and the frustration about democratic openness in Iran is about. Uh, there, there's a sense in which neither the Puritan top-down sort of uh, edicts of the revolution and its interpretation of gender roles, for example, are appropriate to the next generation, the globalized generation, nor do they all want to just adopt the culture of Los Angeles and import it into to Iran. And so th there's actually a discourse that's already underway in Iran about how to reinterpret the revolution. The problem is that there isn't political space to carry that through. And I think it's interesting to compare Iran's circumstances to Pakistan on the one hand and Saudi Arabia on the other, and Patrick invited me to do that. I think in this respect, you know, Pakistan is already engaged in this reinterpretation and this synthesis. Uh, it's part of a 60-year narrative about Pakistani identity, a state founded in the name of Islam but never sort of fully uh, um, organized around uh, Islamic law or Islamic identity. And now there's this continuous uh, questioning uh, as generations pass through about how to create that synthesis. In Pakistan, there's much more open space to conduct that conversation because there's a free media, there's a constitutional democracy, however flawed, that is far more uh, fully evolved than the one in Iran. Uh, and then on the other hand, in Saudi Arabia, on the other bookend, you basically have no oxygen for that conversation. You have a state that is very heavily insistent upon orthodoxy. You have a younger generation that, on the one hand, uh, wants to have a conversation about this orthodoxy and on the other hand has no permission to hold that conversation and so it's a, it's a much more bottled up uh, culture. Um, and I, I, I was struck as well uh, by um, this appetite for accountability that persists even as the sort of moment of, of uh, fervor of five years ago evaporates. Uh, there, there does uh, remain a, a common desire in places like Iran and Pakistan. I'm always uh, reminded, and, it, and as Flint says, it's, it's not unusual in this country either. People have a, a desire to make their own mistakes. They, they would like possession of their own uh, narrative, and they would, and they're entirely prepared to accept that politics is flawed. They just want um, the space to control their own flawed narrative. Um, in that sense, I think people are more sophisticated than we sometimes uh, credit them as being. Uh, as as to U.S. policy, I mean, I, I think um, Flint outlined it um, very well. But I just uh, offer one other framework maybe for our discussion. Uh, he, again, uh, this is something that, that Flint described vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but we could also pull it out and talk about it in the Gulf uh, and in the context of sanctions and, and debates about military pressure. And that is the failure of U.S. politics over time to figure out, and Ken said this at the beginning, uh, citing the Cold War as a successful model. And of course, it was a pretty zigzagged success and, and hardly uh, complete. But the, the failure of US policy repeatedly to calibrate its interactions between elites and publics and, uh, to, and to sort out consistently how uh, to manage that difficult equation 
But the uh, context in which this failure occurs vis-a-vis -vis Iran is shaped by U.S. policy in the broader Middle East, which is so heavily oriented toward elites. And one reason why I think Iranians recognize a kind of uh, sort of hypocrisy in U.S. democracy promotion in their own country is that they see the absence of it next door. And they're, they're living in a, in a global media culture, and they recognize that U.S. engagements in Saudi Arabia have, have essentially given up on uh, bottom-up reform because perhaps the United States fears uh, public opinion at the Saudi grassroots. And equally, in uh, the rest of the Arab world, uh, there's a recognition over the last year that the democracy promotion agenda has declined on an order of priorities. And I think that that, I would hypothesize that that is tied to the hardening of Iranian attitudes about U.S. democracy promotion on their own soil. That if, if the U.S. had had a successful broader democracy promotion agenda, Iranians might be willing to interpret it in their own context in a, in a different way. And I think they did five or six years ago, but now no more, uh, because I think they have a pretty clear-eyed view of, um, of the duality of American approaches to elites and publics in their own neighborhood. So we'll report to your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve, Flint, and Ken. Um, I think just before we get into a general q and I think I, I saw all the, all the speakers up here taking copious notes. Um, perhaps um, I'll ask one or two questions to get it off, but that, start off the, the, the dialogue, but then ask um, the panelists to ask any questions of, of each other, um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, my first question is a quick one to Ken. Um, it seems that this kind of information, this data, is extremely important in the formu formulation of U.S. policy. And the quick question is, to what extent, you know, I know that your uh, Tariff Free Tomorrow is an independent, non, you know, not funded by the government. To what extent has any branch of the government, executive or legislative, come to you to talk about the, these findings. Um, in this poll or other polls, how curious are they about you know, what I think is just a really important component of the formulation of, of public policy? Yeah, I, I think that they are curious. Um, um, uh, you know, this may not be common knowledge, but the U.S. government, the State Department, does fund its own polling in a lot of countries that it classifies as a uh, secret or confidential. Um, I, I used to be a proponent of that. I used to think that was a good idea for our government to find out what other publics think on its own. I now think it's a terrible idea because I think the government uh, 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 trying, I, I think that even if it's an independently, uh, even if it's kept confidential or secret, uh, the, it's tainted right at the source. and to uh, uh, find out what public opinion thinks, you, you do need independent, non-government funded uh, organizations. Otherwise, at the end of the day, they don't have credibility. But the government is interested. I think the State Department is interested. The Defense Department is interested. This is a change, um, uh, and the Hill is interested. I, I think they're becoming more interested than they used to be. Are they sufficiently interested? No, but they are interested. That's, that's helpful. Um, and then for Steve and Flint, um, to what extent uh, do you think that there's, there are options, given this polling data, to what extent are there options for unilateral moves vis-a-vis -vis Iran, uh, in the, uh, specifically in the next administration coming in? Um, depending on what happens, there may be a call for um, fast improvement of the image of U.S. in the world. Um, but some of these, um, some, of, some of the, uh, are some of the, the polling data here suggest that the U.S. could unilaterally make some moves uh, in terms of our relations with Iran, um, and uh, and that the that may not be necessarily a, a grand bargain, may not be necessarily in the interests of the uh, current leadership. So, is, is there an opportunity there for for unilateral moves? If so, you know, where do you see them? Yeah. Um, I would say a, a, a couple of things. Um, First of all, just in terms of the posture that we've staked out on the nuclear issue, I think that, you know, to require um, Iran to suspend 
its nuclear activities as a precondition for negotiations is really self-defeating. It's self-defeating not just in terms of the, the dynamics of getting into a, a, a bargaining process over the nuclear issue, but I think it, it really, um, you know, it's not scoring us any points um, in Iran. Uh, similarly, I think that, you know, for us to hold to a position that even as part of a larger settlement, you know, that the correct number of centrifuges that Iran should be allowed to operate is zero. That is just a position that is entirely detached from reality, not just in terms of where the Iranian nuclear program is, but that, you know, there essentially is no political space in Iran, I think, for that sort of outcome. More, more boldly, I would say, you know, the smartest thing that a new administration could do uh, coming in if it wanted to do something fast to improve U.S. position in Iran, announce on January 21st, 2009, you know, we're prepared to, um, you know, extend full diplomatic recognition to the Islamic Republic of Iran, and we'd love to open an embassy in, in, in Tehran and want to sit down with Iranian representatives to see you know, how that can be done as fast as possible. Great. Thank you. Steve, any thoughts? Before we turn? Um, I just want to open it up to the panelists if you want to ask each other any questions, follow up. Otherwise, we can turn it over to, to, the, to the group. Okay, sir, right here. Um, if you could state your name yeah, and affiliation. Judd Harriet, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, the one statistic that I saw that really struck me was the percentage, I forget the number, of Iranians in your poll that uh, favored the abolition of the state of Israel. I think it was 62 percent, something like that. Correct. My question is directed at Mr. Leverett. And in your grand bargain that I was reading about in your paper, from the U.S. side, the grand bargain would have to include a resolution of the Israeli issue, recognition by uh, Iran of the state of Israel, or at least uh, cessation of terrorist activities against it to Hezbollah. So how do you reconcile this? This conundrum. Let <laughs> you then. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say you know inevitably in these kinds of negotiations, um, we are asking the Iranian government to do some things which are going to be unpopular. Um, and I think we have to calib we have to make some sort of assessment of how much we can ask them to do unpopular things and how much if we ask them to do unpopular things, we're just going to get nowhere. Now, my own view is that on the nuclear issue, to ask for you know a final outcome that says Iran can't run any centrifuges on its own territory is is simply a non-starter. Um, Someone might want to argue, based on looking at this polling data, that it's a non-starter to ask the Islamic Republic to alter its position toward Israel. My sort of tactical response to that would be, okay, I don't necessarily need them to alter their formal posture toward Israel. I just need them to be willing to say that they would not oppose a two-state solution if, you know, legitimate Palestinian leaders were to agree to a two-state solution. And within that framework, we would also want some, you know, very practical kinds of restraint on the sorts of support that is extended to groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Um, I'm not necessarily asked, I wouldn't ask Iran to recognize Israel immediately. Um, I would simply ask for, President Hatami himself suggested this formulation, that Iran wasn't going to be in the end more Palestinian than the Palestinians. And, you know, if legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people agree to a two-state solution, 
basically what I want is for Ron not to get in the way of that. Another question? Can I just add a sure. quick comment sure. to that? Which is the key, I think, Clint, to what you're saying, is it goes back in a circle, though. Who are the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people? Because if Hamas goes along and Islamic Jihad goes along, I think that might change the Iranian dynamic. Yeah, exactly. But if they don't, I, I in that case, much it, more. In that, and in that case, it's not going to work. You know, you're well, not going to have a deal anyway. Right. So. Well, that, that may be. Sorry. Um, back to you. I'm Bob Actolby with National Iran American Council. Um, the BBC just released a poll just last week um, of Iranian attitudes as well. And I'm wondering if, if you took a look at that, were there any distinctions, any huge differences or similarities that popped out at you? I, I haven't seen that poll. Well, so oh, you haven't seen it? Sir, the red. Mm -hmm. William Royce, Voice of America. Um, a question for Candy Flint and a question for Ken and Steve. First question is U.S. policy, traditional narrative, is sort of based on the expectation the Iranian people want to change the regime. But what you have found is that they want to make it work, but not necessarily, as I interpret it not necessarily want to do away with it. And one example, I want this is where I can. The interesting thing, of course, everybody's picked up at headlines and so forth. They want to vote for the Supreme Leader. But there's been nothing, but they, they seem by saying that, they accept the idea of a Supreme Leader. Have you, uh, did you ask that? Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I, I think what you're saying uh, um, is, is generally accurate. I, I will say this, um, not, not to in any way uh, take away from the legitimacy of what we're finding. There are limits to polling in a country like Iran. Um, I would be very nervous asking a direct question like that and feeling that Iranians are going to respond in a completely honest and open fashion. It is an authoritarian state. Let's remember that. I think we do better in these surveys with some of the more indirect questions. It may make it harder to interpret, but I think we get more honest answers that way. I think, uh, you know, and for me to ask, I, I wouldn't ask that question because I don't feel like we're, I wouldn't have confidence in the results. So I don't, at the end of the day, I think Flint's interpretation is fair of the data, and I would tend to agree with it, but I'm not sure because we can't really ask directly, do you want to overthrow the system? <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that, that, that would be a non-starter as a question. <laughs> yeah, I, I would definitely spot Ken that one. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that would be very edifying to go into Iran and ask that, that question that directly. Um, yeah, as uh, something that Steve Call said, you know, talking about the 98 to 2002 period when, when President Hatami was sort of at the height of his political popularity and, and I guess, you know, hopes for the reformist project were, were at their highest. I, I, I would argue that even then, I don't, I wouldn't characterize Iranian public opinion then as a pre-revolutionary state. And the reason I say that, and it's going to sound somewhat cold-blooded, but um, I'm, I'm going to go with it. Um, you know, in the end, you know, a very, you know, a relatively small number of students were killed in demonstrations. And the movement folded. In 1978 and 1979, when the Iranian Revolution got off the ground, the Shah's army killed a lot more Iranians than that. And the crowds still kept coming. Now that is a revolution. And Iran, even in you know, sort of, I think there was, I think, I think Steve's description of the you know, sort of profound disappointment with, with Hatami that ultimately, especially urban kinds of political activists in Tehran, student activists, felt, I think that was a very profound disappointment. But I would say, you know, it didn't translate into a real revolutionary state. Because, I mean, I, my sort of crude litmus test for a revolutionary condition is 
when the army shoots at you, these still keep coming. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add to that first? Uh, you know, I have no disagreement with that interpretation. I um, remember listening to these student leaders describe what happened between, and they were in their early to mid 20s and quite idealistic. Uh, and they, they described their own experience at that crucial moment when the shooting began and when the, the stakes kept being raised by the uh, government. And some of them described their own parents, this was in sort of Tehran, of course, as uh, referring to 78 and 79 and essentially driving them out to the demonstrations and tossing them out of the car and saying, and when I was your age, <laughs> we stood firm against the guns. Get out there! And, and, uh, and, sort of describe, and saying, in effect, they were under parental pressure to be more uh, stalwart than, than they were. But I also think that part of the explanation for why uh, that moment unfolded the way it did is the resilience of the Iranian state. Dysfunctional, lumpy, internally divided, though it may be in many respects, the foundations and the employment systems that they built up, the just the sheer weight of uh, petrodollars, which of course, you know, structurally, since the bottom of oil prices in the late 90s, what has been the pattern? More and more resources being poured down mm -hmm. channels that, however inefficient, nonetheless, are patronage machines. And so, in the end, it's not then so much only public opinion or even aspiration that is at issue in measuring Iranian national desires. It's also the kind of resiliency of this rubbery state with all of its patronage channels. And, and I think between those two things, there, there was no pre-revolutionary moment. And, and yeah. Hatami wouldn't support the students. Right. right. Yes, and he wouldn't support the students. And, and one more footnote, sir, that, which I think is important, just to pick up on your point, uh, as my, my <coughs> colleague Kareem Sajapur likes to say at the Carnegie, which is who's actually willing to put their life on the line yeah. right. in this situation? Will it be the Revolutionary Guard? Will it be the students? Who's, who's willing to actually risk their life? Uh, quickly, the yeah, second question. Be very quickly. Quick. Um, can you add a number of points, this we can and Steve, where public opinion in Pakistan in the earlier poll and in Iran coincided? Through the same. Now, I'm wondering. Did they could, were they the same on perception of U.S. foreign policy in the region? And secondly, do you think if we got out of Iraq, this would change perceptions toward us in Pakistan and Iran? Um, there are two different answers to both okay. of your questions, right. because they're actually two different questions. Yeah. On the issue of similar per perceptions, there are, a lot, there are a lot of similarities in terms of U.S. foreign policy between Pakistanis and Iranians and per perception. But to echo Steve's comment on Pakistan, which I think is very important, in Pakistan they're willing to tell you whether they like Musharraf or not. Right. That, that's not a question you can ask directly right. in Iran. So it, there's much more open space to express discontent. <coughs> um, uh, but in Pakistan is a whole another discussion. And I think the, 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 the second part of your question was um, uh, getting out of Iraq. I, I, I think for Iranians, that, that looms more important than Pakistanis um, who have other views about whether the United States is going to invade Pakistan that's more directly affecting their opinion in the United States than what we're doing in Iraq. Yeah, I would just add only that I think my reading of the numbers is, and my sense uh, qualitatively is that uh, actually Iranian opinion about American foreign policy while increasingly negative and now tipping uh, into a plurality of negative views is actually somewhat more forgiving of U.S. foreign policy than uh, Pakistani public opinion at the moment. Right now I think Pakistani public opinion is even more hardened against, uh, yeah, I against the U.S. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. In the back there. There's a question from both Kenneth Flint. Can you just say more about the apparent conflict in the numbers where a majority of the Iranians favor the nuclear weapons, but a greater majority are willing to give it up for aid and investment? There seems to be a different take on that. No, 
my my read of the data wasn't that they're prepared to to they're not prepared to give up nuclear energy they are prepared to accept measures that would ensure that whatever nuclear program they have is not being used as a basis of a weapons program and you know there are various numbers of you know well what would you like to get in return for that would you like you know free trade would you like assistance with your civil nuclear program and there are various numbers for that um, I, it's it's a good question we, we know what what generates that mix of attitudes I, I would hypothesize that part of it is that the Iranian the Iranian government presents the nuclear program to the Iranian people as a civil nuclear program it is it is an Iranian effort to become a technologically sophisticated country and in fact the public line from the regime on nuclear weapons is that we don't have them we don't want them and it is indeed against our religion to have them now what that's kind of the public presentation from the regime to the Iranian people of you know what this nuclear program is about what's interesting to me is that Ken's numbers sh would show that the Iranian people have not entirely bought that line. That, you know, most of them probably realize at some level, well, yeah, it's about civil nuclear technology becoming technologically sophisticated. But yeah, this could also be the basis for a nuclear weapons program. And okay, do we think that's a good idea or not? And it seems as if at a certain level, you know, at least half of, I think 52% of the Iranian people think that's okay but relative to their sort of very much stronger support for nuclear energy they seem more willing to give up the nuclear weapons aspect in return for you know some set of benefits out there they're more willing to give that up than they are willing to give up the nuclear program as a whole that's how I try to square that but yeah, Flynn, I, I think you're entirely accurate. I, I would concur in everything you say. That's how you would square the two. I just want to add an interesting sidelight, which is uh, a similarity between Saudis and Iranians, which is a little bit disturbing. A majority of Saudis now favor that the Saudi Arabia develop nuclear weapons, too. So we may be headed, and I think you're exactly right, the regime presents this as a nuclear energy issue but Iranians are seeing through that to some degree mm -hmm. and are becoming more accepting of nuclear weapons that was a change between in the last six months and not uh, 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 an insignificant one and uh, we see the Saudis uh, becoming also more accepting of nuclear weapons this is not a, weapons a and not energy weapons weapons and we asked Saudis do they want energy too uh, they weren't as keen on energy, and they were more focused on weapons. <laughs> Maybe they were dissatisfied with the with the NIE's conclusion that the Iranian regime had actually given up the <laughs> weapons part of the program. The Iranian right. public said, "No, no, no, you guys need to get back on that." Right, right. <laughs> um, I have two quick questions. One is if you could identify so yourself too. Just in transit from the Netherlands. Um, one is to say a little bit more about uh, how you. Uh, the first question was the Sorry. Uh, how did how did how did Ken get to uh, distribute the uh, the uh, demo demographically across rural and urban uh, respondents to the to the poll? And then the second question, Josephine, if you could. The, the timing of uh, possible uh, of, of approaching the Iranians or engaging with Iran, whether it should be in January uh, 2009 or after the presidential election. 
should we wait until after the presidential elections? Okay. Uh, the survey was conducted across all 30 provinces of Iran, and it's proportionally dis distributed. Um, it was a computer-generated telephone survey. Our, how we do that, how it matches up, is up on the website, and I would defer to my colleagues in the front row here from D3 Systems. Um, they also have it up on their website, d3systems.com. Ours is terrafreetomorrow.org, so you can access that technical information. But they're very expert into polling in Iran, and they've been doing it uh, since 2004 for uh, various uh, 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 measures. So I, I would commend that. But it is a, like any other, it's like a survey of the United States or the Netherlands. You get all the telephone exchanges, you put them in a computer, you generate ur urban rural, you, you, you do a randomized sample. So the same techniques that would apply to a poll of the Netherlands or, or the United States. Are Is the that issuance representative? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. Are the calls generated from outside the country? Or the, the country? That's an extremely important point. The calls are generated from outside the country. Um, and. Uh, uh, we do not publicly say where they're coming from for security reasons. Um, all the interviewers are uh, native Farsi speaking, but it is a country in the region. Um, and it's not identified as, uh, as an American enterprise because I think that would harm the results. Was the government aware that you were doing it? No. The government is aware, however, of our, our, our work. Subsequent to that, what is their attitude toward it? Uh, very interesting. Um, as, as, as some of you may know, they launched this uh, 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 media uh, organization called Press TV, spent at least $25 million launching that. They routinely report on our surveys. They have a funny way of interpreting some of them, but they, they, <laughs> they routinely report on our work. Um, uh, they've also uh, uh, contacted me to work together with them in the future, an offer that I declined. Um, but um, they're very aware of what, what, what the results are. I have not seen any reports of this latest survey but, um, yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. Actually, that's not true. There has been some reports in um, some of the state media. And again, it was taking... It, 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 uh, as someone in, in, back in the audience said they saw it, but I, what I've heard is they, they, they have, you know, they'll, they'll selectively report it. They won't put the poll, uh, poll results up there. They'll say, they, uh, an American organization found that uh, most Iranians think the economy is going in the right direction, or something like that. That's how they'll play it. <coughs> Flint on the timing I, I, I think you should offer to go on press TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do, do, do this. Well, <laughs> <then> the <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the timing issue. Yeah, I know. <coughs> I think probably there's there's a sense in the foreign policy community that whatever the United, a new American administration might be inclined to do differently with Iran, maybe it's better to wait until after their own presidential election, which presumably comes around May of 2009. Um, you know, there, there's certainly kind of prudential wisdom in that. I mean, the question I was asked <laughs> and why I said January 21st, 2009 was, you know, what could we do, what could a new administration do immediately to improve American standing in Iran? And I was, you know, given what Ken's polling data said about the interest of Iranians in, in having U.S. representation there, having access to visas, having access to trade, you know, you, you could argue you want to be able to have those things as cards that you play in a negotiation. And, and usually I think it's kind of a bad idea to try and play, um, you know, Iranian politics or any other country's politics. I just don't know we're so good at it. Um, but in this case, I actually would be willing to entertain the idea um, that, in a sense, you don't really care about the election outcome. You just say, okay, here's what, we're, we are changing U.S. policy toward the Islamic Republic of Iran. And it's not about Ahmadinejad or the absence of Ahmadinejad. It's about we want to have a different kind of policy toward the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, you know, when, when Nixon made the decision that it was time to reorient 25 years of American policy toward the People's Republic of China, he didn't wait for Chairman Mao to die. He didn't wait for the Cultural Revolution to end. Um, he did it 
because he thought it was in American interests to do it. And, you know, I, I think that there would be things we could do um, in advance of the Iranian election which would have a positive impact. Um, I mean, can you imagine in that regard, can you imagine, you know, what fits that would cause Ahmadinejad? If we just, you know, there's plenty of precedent for countries, you know, deciding to, you know, take back their diplomatic recognition of a government they don't like. I don't think that they, I don't know of a precedent, you know, if we just said, okay, we want to recognize the Islamic Republic of Iran, you know, what is, is the Islamic Republic of Iran going to refuse, can you refuse to be diplomatically recognized by, <laughs> by another country? I mean, we would just cause such, such conniption fits within their system by, by doing that. And, and these polls would suggest the Iranian people would be saying, yeah, this is, this is really good. What, you know, what's, what's wrong with this? So I think there may be a few things I mean, I don't think we're going to do that anyway. So, you know, but, you know, that would be one thing where if we were really prepared to be bold and think outside the box, I might even propose doing that without, without waiting for the... The thing is, any of the candidates who would be actually make the idea? No. Right. No. Um, my sense is that even, even the Democratic candidates you know, to the I, I think if, the, if, it, if a democratic administration takes office in January, it will rhetorically give more of a priority to engaging Iran than the Bush administration did. But I think they're going to go about it in ways that will be guaranteed to fail because they're going to go about it in ways that are designed to protect various domestic flanks here. And it will completely undermine the effectiveness of that engagement with either the Iranian elite or the Iranian public. Okay, so I'm going to cluster. Can, go I think, can I just add one, not to completely disagree with what Clint That's is saying, right. but one little <laughs> bit of footnote here, which is the problem we have in, in doing his suggestion on January 21st is that when the Iranians had a more moderate government in with Khatami, and they had a reformist regime, and they reached out to the United States, and we rejected them. If we go and reward, seemingly, I, I know how, I, I, I'm not sure it would cause him conniption fits. He, he, would, he would say, see, my hard line paid off. The United <laughs> States came, and I, I stiffed them, and they came. That's the right attitude, not the reformist attitude. So that's the one note of caution, and it w I think it would be played as, you know, I, I think he would see it as a huge victory. I think the hardliners would see it as a huge victory. And rather than reject the U.S., say, okay, open your embassy. We won. We got everything. Right. And I, I would just say I think that's part of a continuing and very sophisticated discourse inside Iranian, all the participants and constituents of Iranian politics about how the benefits of engagement with the United yeah. States will be distributed internally. Not so much just the benefits to the economy and access to, the, to uh, education and global culture, but um, what the cascading effects will be over time. And so there will be those debates at every step of engagement. And I agree that it would, it's a fool's game to try to anticipate the complexity of those cascades. But I do think there probably is an issue about when you start that process exactly, because once it begins, there will be a whole new dynamic inside um, the Iranian political competition. Okay. Now we have time for just one more, and I already identified this yes, gentleman I'm, back here. I'm Greg Aftandilian, uh, foreign policy advisor, Chris Van Hollen. My question is for Ken. Um, there was an interesting uh, piece in the Washington Post a few days ago where they interviewed people on the Iranian domestic scene. and. One guy, ordinary guy, said that he was critical of Ahmadinejad's Iraq policy because he said, you know, there's too many resources going to Iraq, not enough going, you know, for domestic issues. On the other hand, of course, you have tens of thousands of Iranian pilgrims going to the Shia holy sites in Iraq. So I was wondering if you've had any data about the perception of Iran, Iranian government's Iraq policy and how that plays. You know, I, 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 we did ask about that, and we asked if the, it's kind of, I, I guess, Iranians are somewhat conflicted uh, because they support 
the government providing military and financial assistance to Iraqi Shiite militia groups. So there is support for that aid. But they're also willing to have the, uh, their government sit down with the United States and negotiate over Iraq. So they're of, uh, that's the way they feel. I think uh, the same kind of numbers we saw with supporting Hamas, with supporting Hezbollah, also supported the Iraqi Shiite militia groups. And this, the, the, these are results that, um, uh, and the ones about Israel, where, where people who comment on the poll, this one and the prior one, particularly Iranians and particularly Iranian Americans, uh, uh, feel that th this is totally inaccurate, <coughs> totally wrong, and this is not what Iranians really think. <laughs> it's what our data showed. It's what the data showed. Good way to end. Um, and with that, I want to thank Ken, uh, Flint, and Steve, and Terra Free Tomorrow and D3 Systems for the polling. Um, thank you so much, and we'll see you again.